so that um, you can kind of pave your own way and do what you love to do. Because if you do, if you do what you love to do, you don't work a day in your life. So I've been really fortunate to kind of find my, um, really what I, what I am passionate about and my goals um, and everything is kind of wrapped around that. So these are my two main assistants, Carrie and Marissa. They're right in the middle next to me and they have been with me since day one. They're amazing and big shout out to you guys. So thank you for, for everything that you've done. Um, <clears throat> they care for our patients compassionately. They've helped me develop the program. They've been there since um, the first patient that I've seen. And so it's been um, my, my backbone and my support team. So thank you so much. Um, and then you'll see on the <clears throat> right hand of your screen is one of the phrenectomy rooms. So just a totally different setting from the dental office. Um, there are no drills, there is no, um, you know, dental chairs or anything like that. It's just completely different. It's relaxing. It's what I believe um, patient care should be in this setting. So uh, really important for me to have that um, calm, um, relaxing setting for patients and for their parents and so that everyone can um, just relax. And it's a really stressful time. So I'm going to go into my story and how I kind of got it how I got into it. Um, and everyone has their why, of course. Um, so these are my girls. Um, <clears throat> on the left hand of the screen, you'll see this is my Stella Fay, And um, she, <clears throat> excuse me, she is about um, almost five and then Fiona is almost three. And so Stella is really my, my first baby that really taught me a lot about obviously being a mom, but she is a great example of everything that could have gone wrong with like my pregnancy, with the birth, with feeding her afterwards, with, with everything. It was just so eye-opening. So, you know, now at almost five, she's doing great. And she's, she's just an amazing child, but man, like I went through the ringer with her. And so I can really um, empathize with a lot of the moms that come in um, and they're in tears and they're, they've just been like bounced around from here to there and no answers, the wrong answers, just, um, just really a stressful time in any mother's life, especially for a new mom. So Stella was born um, at 35 weeks and she had IUGR because of um, undiagnosed severe preeclampsia. So my whole story was just really traumatic and um, I'm not going to go into detail of that, but you can see in the pictures that she had, um, diff she was in the NICU, feeding tubes, bottle fed, um, breast fed. I mean, you name it, we tried it. And, um, and I really, what really kind of set everything apart for me was that I didn't have good support as far as feeding her. Um, and so, so much of what I know now, um, pertains to like the story of everything, of how she, um, like growth and development wise, um, I could have done X, Y, Z. If I would have known, I would have done something different. And so I really feel like a lot of parents kind of struggle with the same um, issues that I had with her, um, just being bounced around and no clear answers. And um, so it's really been my mission to take the time to explain you know, what I see now as, as an infant, um, how that relates into um, the, the children as they're developing from like up to like a year old and then up to um, they're just from like three to five when like Lauren would be seeing them um, and how that relates to um, adulthood and, and what we can do for infants um, and like the red flags that show up and what we can do um, that's a minor procedure or just a support system that we can have and how that can impact the child's life and um, future as an adult. So on the right hand of the screen is Fiona. Now Fiona was born full term and she was um, eight pounds. So Stella was four pounds, Fiona was eight pounds, but they're both tongue tied and um, totally different experiences with them. Um, but the same thing where, you know, I learned so much from each story, um, from each path that we had. So now that they're a little bit older, um, you can see they're happy, healthy, um, and they are 
really the reason why I do what I do. Um, they keep me very busy. And so um, certainly this is the first time in three weeks that I've actually done my hair and put some makeup on. Um, as most of you probably know, <laughs> I don't look like this all the time, um, especially not at home with um, two toddlers and I'm like almost 38 weeks pregnant. So um, <clears throat> they definitely keep me busy. But um, so my program started three years ago. Um, it was it was actually with Fiona that um, I saw the right IBCLC and she was like, wow, you are struggling because of X, Y, Z. Um, and I, I really I actually called and um, I think Gwen, you might have taken the call. And I was like, I'm a dentist. Um, I think there's something going on, but I know my, my baby does not have a tongue tie. I would know if they had a tongue tie. And, um, and I'll never forget that because then like looking back, I'm so embarrassed, but um, I definitely said that uh, on the phone and she's like, no, just come in, just have a comprehensive exam. And so I did, and it really changed the trajectory of um, my nursing relationship with Fiona. Um, and then also what I do in my professional career. So that was um, three years ago. Since then, I've seen almost, um, I think like 800 babies um, and children and some adults. Um, so I've had a quite, quite a bit of experience um, and none of it could be possible without the comprehensive care that we um, get from using a multidisciplinary team-based setting. So that's the most important thing that I can really ingrain in, into anyone that's here, whether they're a provider or um, a parent, is that it does, it's not just one person that works with you and is like your solution to everything. It's really having a team approach and like the support system. So um, <clears throat> basically I started seeing babies in my general practice and um, my experience with having my, um, my Fiona's um, tongue and lip release, that experience really led me to develop a program that I thought would be appropriate for from like a mother's point of view. So um, it was, she had great treatment, but I was like, man, there's so much more that that could be done for, um, for the parents to feel comfortable for the home care. Um, and so from that experience, I really started um, kind of setting up my own program and implementing things that I thought were really important. Um, so now at the pain and sleep center, we are in a non-dental setting, which helps so much because um, we are not in a busy waiting room. It's much more personal. And the, the, the whole um, the atmosphere is just totally different. So um, we're very proud of that. And we offer really excellent care to our patients there. And we're able to have everything under one roof, which is really important for the parents, especially the newborn, that you don't want to be um, dragging all over town and like going from one person to the next. So the more we can incorporate um, the multidisciplinary team um, under one roof is, is a win for us. Um, so anyways, I've been um, on this journey of continuing ed. Um, so probably at least 500 hours by now. Um, I also um, am certified in oral facial myology. So everything that Lauren does, I, I want to understand. And, you know, I, I basically, you know, I want to know exactly what everyone in the office is doing. And so that's just part of being a dentist. You got to have control of everything. Um, and so um, we've taken so many courses together and um, just really understanding how the muscles and the tongue and everything affects um, growth and development from infancy into adulthood. So um, the study of that is super important and you're, you're gonna learn a lot more from, um, from Lauren. She's gonna go into detail, but we work together with our pediatric patients, usually the ones starting at about um, two, three years old. So um, again, my career, my career goals are really the diagnosis and um, treatment of restrictions and then how that affects growth and development. That's, that is such a huge part to everything. Um, and I'm gonna answer some questions and um, you know, I welcome any questions at any point. And like I said earlier, we have um, some IBCLCs, we have an SLP in the audience um, and I'm sure they'd be help, like, more than happy to answer any questions that I can't at the end. Okay. All right, so starting with the first question. So, and also thank you to everyone that sent in questions. 
So first question, um, I've never heard of tongue ties before and now it seems like everyone has one. Why is that? So I hear that so frequently, especially from the dads um, when, they're, when they're in uh, for their baby's appointment. Um, the moms are usually like well researched and they're they're there they they know why they've they've seen the ibclcs the dads are the ones that are kind of like hold on like give me a second here but um the truth is that it's it's not anything new um it just appears there's we have such an information overload right now um, with social media it's very easy to access information and have it targeted to you um, but are tongue ties new? Absolutely not. Um, we have biblical references um, that date back thousands of years. Um, the hierarchy of care um, with um, newborns has changed. You know, it started off, we had midwives, we had mothers, grandmothers, a, like a whole family hierarchy that would help um, newborns and um, and mamas out there and these things would just get taken care of like they they say that the midwives would have like long fingernails and they would just like cut the um, front of them right then and there so um, there's it's not anything new um, but what has changed is how we are exposed to everything so um, babies are smart their number one job is to feed and um, and so when they are not able to do that efficiently or effectively, that's when you start to get symptoms. And so <clears throat> we have this huge movement of breastfeeding versus formula. So um, Ryan presented some good books um, out there. There's books all about like the history of um, formula and breastfeeding and the controversy, et cetera. Um, but certainly now there's a, a big movement with breastfeeding. And so when a lot of these moms are attempting to breastfeed their babies, a lot of the hospitals now have like the breastfeeding designations. Um, and so we're getting these red flags, okay? And that may be um, nipple trauma, pain, um, babies not gaining weight. Well, there's, I mean, there's a whole slew of, of symptoms that will appear if a baby is not able to do what they're supposed to do. And then they start compensating. And so um, I like to tell my parents, I'm like, the babies should, you're supposed to be using A, B, and C to do the job. But when you start compensating to get the job done, you start incorporating other tissues, muscles, and you're, you're basically in overdrive. And it presents differently in different um, situations. But um, the bottom line is that the one thing that moms really have is after they have a baby, they have, um, they'll have a nursing baby and they have a free hand to hold their cell phone and start Googling things. And so we have much more awareness now and the moms are really advocating for themselves and for their babies. Um, 20, 30 years ago, if you had pain when you started breastfeeding, if you even attempted to breastfeed, you would just get formula in a bottle thrown at you and see you later. But now moms are really advocating for themselves. And so um, we have much more uh, freedom of like social media, the internet and time to hold your phone while you're nursing and um, really do some Googling. And um, there's a lot of misinformation. There's a lot of good information. The um, really the, the issue with it is to, um, get the correct information, but then to see a specialist and really see how that applies to you. And if that, um, what we don't like to see is online, like peer diagnosis, you need to see a specialist. So um, another thing that comes up is the MTH FR gene mutation. So that's the point of controversy, whether that is causing more tongue ties. Um, there is no good research on that out just yet, um, but basically what it, what it is in a nutshell, and I was trying to like read up and freshen my memory about it, um, but there's like four pages of just lots of information, but that gene mutation basically does not allow you to metabolize folic acid, um, and folic acid is the synthetic version of folate. Folate is what you find um, in like spinach, it's, it's basically B9. Um, and so when you are not able to metabolize that, 
um, and it's not getting absorbed, then you potentially have other issues from that. And one of them may be a midline defect, which is um, a tongue tie or so. So no, but there's no like strong studies on that. They're, um, they're still working on that. So we don't really know, maybe, maybe not. Um, another, so I kind of touched up on this, but social media era, era um, it's, it's very prevalent. Tongue ties are very pre prevalent right now because we have social media, we have the internet. And so you can, like I said, you can Google it. You can, you know, you type in um, nipple pain and all of a sudden your baby has a tongue tie and a lip tie and everyone's convinced. Um, but so the solution to that is get a specialist to take a look. Um, and I wrote in here H1N1 versus COVID-19 um, because, <clears throat> You know, in 2009, H1N1 came out, um, and that was a pandemic, and a lot of people lost their lives. But you didn't hear about it because that was before social media, like, really came out. And now, I mean, the it has like that's all we do now is look at Facebook, and um, so it just kind of goes to show the difference between um, what 10 years can make um, in in the media aspect of things. All right, so question number two. Um, lactation consultants at the hospital, my pediatrician says my baby's fine, but I'm having a really painful latch. My supply is getting worse. Um, I'm in pain. Help me, no one's listening. I don't know what to do. Um, so that's another thing that we, we hear all the time. Um, and so what I tell my parents um, is that everyone has frenums. So first and foremost, having a frenum totally normal, all right? When we have a frenum that is functionally restrictive, that's when it turns into a tongue tie or a lip tie. So the most common thing that we see are these, like, or the lip ties that are actually not lip ties, but they're just, it's normal anatomy. So um, you have to be able to differentiate the two, what is normal, what is not, um, and that really, um, depends on a functional assessment. So tongue ties, you can have an anterior versus a posterior. And you can see here in these pictures um, on the right side of your screen. Um, so the top one is an anterior tongue tie. That's the classic one that you see, um, like in textbooks, on, online, very easy to find that. And um, typically they, they'll be noticed right away. The hospital, sometimes they are actually, um, and quite a few times they're not, and I'll see babies come in at like six months old with um, a tongue tie that's even worse than that. Like the tongue's attached to the, to the ridge there and you kind of wonder how that gets by, you know, overlooked for that long. But the ones that are really difficult to diagnose are the posterior tongue ties, um, which is on the bottom, like on the bottom of the screen. So the big question is what is normal and what is a restriction? and you really need to have a functional assessment. So um, what we use, um, and it's a validated, validated and objective um, assessment tool is the hat lift. Um, and this is done by a professional and it, and it basically evaluates objectively the function and the appearance. So along with the functional assessment, this is how the tongue is moving, um, how it's moving sideways, how it's moving up, um, along with the appearance of it, and then along with the history and the symptoms that the mom is having. So we put all three of those things together to really evaluate function. And the most important thing, especially for an infant, is that you have a really good lactation consultant or an SLP, an IBCLC, which is a board certified lactation consultant, do a comprehensive one-on-one um, -on -one visit. So it's very important to have the baby evaluated, the mom evaluated, and then the fit um, of both together, the, the mother-baby diet evaluated. So it's not, it's not one or the other, um, it's really how everything fits together. Um, and then having a, proper, um, having a proper assessment of function is really important. So um, that would be my biggest thing to recommend is finding the right person to help you. Um, what we are really trying to educate um, our providers with, um, especially our pediatricians, is to not say, hey, your baby is fine. Hey, your baby doesn't have a tongue tie. 
but to say, hey, like I hear that you're having issues nursing, you're having pain, um, that's concerning. This is not my specialty. Um, let me send you to someone who can take um, a really careful and thorough look at your baby and, and, and look at the feeding and look at you and the baby together because as a pediatrician, I'm not gonna ask you to pull down your shirt. I'm not gonna watch you nurse your baby. So, and um, having like a proper assessment by a feeding specialist, um, and then you get, um, you get the help that you need. We weed out anything else that it could possibly be from, um, from supply issues to fit, et cetera. Um, and then possibly you might end up at my office and then I do my own assessment and I basically diagnose and we go from there. So um, it's just really important and really working hard to um, educate our providers to, to take the proper steps instead of saying yes or no to, um, to a mother and kind of dismissing them or sending them kind of like in a mixed direction and, and without um, really anywhere to go. All right, so this is another one that I hear a lot. Um, so moms will say, you know what, like, I don't need a breastfeed, breastfeed is pain, breastfeeding is painful, I'm really struggling, like, this is, this is terrible, um, I know my baby, like, okay, I understand my baby has a tongue tie, um, I'm gonna just bottle feed, like, and I'm okay with that. Um, is it selfish of me to have the procedure done because I want to breastfeed if my baby would be fine on the bottle? So that's the million dollar question, right? My job is to educate um, I'm not here to um, tell you that you have to do something. I present the facts and the research and really um, kind of help you make the right decision for your family. What you'll see from what Lauren, Lauren's presentation and from Ryan's presentation is that it's not all about breastfeeding. It's not, breastfeeding is wonderful, has tremendous um, benefits to growth and development um, of the oral facial complex but it goes way beyond that. So um, it really go, it's the scope of, if you have a tongue tie, okay, a functional restriction, that will in some aspect affect your child um, with possible feeding. If it's not with feeding or speech, it's gonna affect them with um, <clears throat> the growth of their upper jaw, okay? So there's a lot of research that shows how um, the tongue being able to elevate and sit at the roof of the mouth, how that molds the upper jaw. The upper jaw, the roof of the mouth is actually the floor of the nose. So when we start talking about airway development. And so if you have a, air, if you have a functional restriction that keeps you from being able to move your tongue the way that it should, you're facing challenges with proper tongue placement. The tongue placement, like I said, affects how everything is going to develop. Um, and the tongue needs a home. The tongue should be parked at the roof of your mouth when you're, when you're not speaking or eating. And that is from age zero to 100. And that affects, develop, that affects airway, that affects how the teeth develop and grow, spacing. Um, I mean, you're, you're gonna see from Dr. Robinson and Lauren's presentation, the far uh, reaching consequences that it has. So what I tell my parents, it's, it's not about necessarily breastfeeding, bottle feeding, but you have to kind of look at the big picture. And we have strong evidence to show how important it is to have a healthy range of motion. So we're not looking for like black or white, like this is 100%, this is uh, failure. We're looking for this range. So we're trying to get these babies that are having these red flags that we know that, you know, mom's having pain, mom's having mastitis, not draining well, the baby may have a failure to, failure to thrive. Um, all these red flags that are saying, hey, hold on, um, I've been checked for everything else. Um, so I know it's not mom's supply, I know it's not this, I know this is a functional issue, why is this happening? And so um, by having all the other stuff ruled out, we know it's a functional issue, it will impact how things develop in the future. And so if you can do a procedure that takes 10 seconds, um, when a baby is two weeks old or two months old, it's a whole heck of a lot easier to reestablish um, 
the, the patterns of, um, of nursing, of basically retraining the brain to, um, to use the tongue properly because you've had less time to develop and really strengthen those kind of like bad habits and those compensations. So um, it's a lot easier to do a 10 second procedure as a baby than it is to do it at two or three or at 12 or at 30 um, because then you're already dealing with growth and development issues. So by age, um, by age seven or so, you already have, um, you know, most of the jaw growth completed. And so the issue is getting it taken care of early on so that you have, um, you've retrained and it's developed, everything has developed properly. Um, so Lauren will go into that a little bit more, um, but that's, that's basically kind of what I tell my parents. It's, it's not about, it's not all about right now, it's about the future and the whole lifespan. Okay, um, so that is pretty much my three questions that I answered. Um, and I will be happy to answer more questions um, from like the old chat box at the end of the presentation. So I hope you guys enjoyed that. So. Oops. So Ryan, can you take over and um, turn this off? I don't know where my mouse went. Yeah. So, all right. Oh, here. You got it? All right, Lauren. All right, good? Yeah, okay. Lauren, you are, you, are, you are good. Sorry, I talked for a long time. No, you're great. <laughs> Sorry. You're good. I just get so excited. I know, it's hard. <laughs> okay, can everyone see that? Can everyone yeah. see it? Okay, good. <laughs> okay, so the first question that I actually got was, is it normal that my six-year-old... Oh, actually, let me introduce myself first. I guess I'm jumping ahead to the questions. So my name is Lauren. I was a dental hygienist for 15 years prior to becoming an oral facial myofunctional therapist and a Buteco educator. So I feel like I can honestly say I've kind of found my true passion now with doing this. Um, so kind of going now into the questions, I was like jumping ahead there. Uh, the first question that I actually got is, is it normal that my six-year-old is still wetting the bed at nighttime? So this is actually a question I get asked very frequently in the office as well. Many parents will kind of share with me that they've been told either by someone or else or a pediatrician that it's normal their child is wetting the bed um, and that eventually they'll outgrow it. Um, however, there have been many studies that have shown a higher prevalence of bedwetting in children with suspected sleep breathing disorders. So bedwetting is obviously common during like Body training years, um, but consider this to be a problem if it is occurring at least twice a week beyond the age of five. So I encourage parents to kind of dig a little deeper and kind of figure out what is going on, especially at nighttime. So I have the sleep st like cycle stages here, and you know the first stage of sleep that we go through. This kind of repeats every 90 to 120 minutes. So the first stage is kind of where we're transitioning. Um, from that awakefulness to sleep. And the second stage is that light sleep. And that third stage is actually that deep sleep. So this is where our body is repairing ourselves. This is actually where the human growth hormone is released, which is really important with kids. And this is actually the stage where bedwetting happens. So um, the brain, what's happening is it's working harder to take in oxygen than it does to actually control other bodily functions like bladder control. So it's basically that failure to awaken when the bladder is full. Um, and then in stage four, we have our deeper sleep. And then stage five is kind of that REM sleep where the rapid eye movement, this is where we're dreaming. And this is kind of where the body is actually paralyzed in that phase of sleep. So I always ask people to kind of just dig a little deeper and kind of figure out, like, observe your child at nighttime, kind of record them at least for two minutes at a time, three different periods of the night. So when they first go to sleep, the middle of the night, and then kind of right before they wake up in the morning to kind of see what's going on, paying attention. Is their mouth open? Are they snoring? You no, know, do they have restless sleep? All of those things are signs of a struggle to breathe. 
So I, that was the first question that I got. Um, the second question that I got was actually on mouth breathing, which I feel like is a topic that I can talk forever and ever about. But the question was, my child has his mouth closed during the day, but it's open at nighttime. Is this an issue and why is this happening? So mouth breathing is never normal. So if it's happening during the day or at night, it's never normal. And typically if it's happening at night, it's usually happening during the day as well. It kind of, and vice, vice versa. So a lot of people kind of associate um, mouth breathing with kind of the mouth hanging open, but even slightly parted lips is considered mouth breathing as well. So some of the main contributors and things that I see on a daily basis in the practice are because of enlarged tonsils and adenoids, um, tongue ties, as Dr. Green talked about as well, usually go hand in hand with mouth breathing, oral habits, so sucking of like the thumb or like two fingers kind of pressing down on that tongue, prolonged use of like pacifier, sippy cup as well, and allergies. So if the nose is congested or someone's allergic to something, usually like dust, dairy, and dander are main culprits as well. And then any restrictions in the nose, such as like a deviated septum. So typically when we breathe through the nose, um, we're breathing in warm, moist, filtered air. Um, we're also getting like nitric oxide, which regulates the blood pressure. It also helps to boost and the immune system as well getting that. And you also get increased oxygen to the brain. So whenever you're breathing through the mouth, you're breathing in dirty, unfiltered air, and that actually causes inflammation on the lymphatic tissue, such as the tonsils and adenoids. And as they get larger, they occupy more space in the airway, and it makes it more difficult for breathing. So, you know, other things as well um, on that topic is that, you know, mouth breathing can also cause like speech impediments, um, forward head posture. So typically people that have like a low resting tongue, their, their head is going to be pushed forward more. And it's actually worse with people who are tongue tied. Um, Cause with a tongue tie, you have that tight restricted fascia, like that runs down the middle of the tongue and it connects to other muscles so and tissues in the body. So that tight restricted fascia um, pulls on the neck kind of, and the shoulders kind of round forward as well. So um, I, one thing I wanted to talk about as well with mouth breathing is with growth and development. So it is essential, like when we're growing, when we're developing, is that we want the lips to be closed. We want the breathing through the nose. We want the tongue resting to the roof of the mouth. So the tongue is kind of the body's natural powder expander. If it's resting in the roof of the mouth, the arches are going to be wide. So in the one picture, you can see how wide the arches are. The teeth are going to come in straight. And most importantly, the airway is going to develop wide. So I usually use the correlation with like, if you're drinking a, like a, say a milkshake and it's a big thick straw. So I correlate that to like a big airway, you know, drinking through that straw, it's nice and wide. Um, whenever you're kind of breathing through the mouth, the mouth is hanging wide open like that, even slightly parted, the tongue is gonna rest to the floor of the mouth. The arches are gonna be very narrow. The teeth are gonna be crowded. You're gonna have a high palatal vault, which actually impinges on the nasal cavity as well. And therefore the airway is gonna develop narrow. So just kind of imagine breathing through a coffee straw to a narrow airway. So that is kind of the struggle to breathe with some of these kids. Um, kind of just imagining between the big straw and the little straw breathing through that. So, and then of course having that low resting tongue, it kind of interferes with your swallow reflux as well. So on to the next question, because I feel like with the mouth breathing, there's so much you can talk about with that one. But the last question that I got was another one that's pretty frequent, and I also it's common with adults as well, is my three-year-old grinds her teeth so loudly at night, it sounds awful. My pediatrician says she will eventually outgrow it. Is this something I should be concerned about, or is there anything I can do to make it stop? So... Of course, hearing that noise, it does sound awful. And, you know, a lot of times people will, even with adults, like they'll say, oh, it's stressed. But a three-year-old is not stressed at nighttime. So typically clenching and grinding, it manifests itself as an underlying airway issue. So I usually kind of use this description. As you clench and grind, you're moving this way. So it's kind of pushing that lower jaw forward. 
to kind of open up the airway. So typically it can occur due to enlarged tonsils and adenoids, any kind of nasal restrictions, anything that really interrupts the airflow. So it's the same with a lot of adult patients that we see. It could be airway here that's restricted, nose, um, or it could be underlying deferred pain elsewhere in the body. So um, like onto the question as far as like how can I make it stop. Really, it's trying to find the root cause is the main thing. And at the practice, that's what we really try to find what that root cause is. Usually snoring, mouth breathing are also common with clenching and grinding. It kind of are other factors that are in that puzzle piece. So again, with like all of these things, like the questions that I got asked with the mouth breathing, the clenching, the grinding, and then even the bedwetting, all of these things are really, I really encourage people to observe, 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 you know, really going in and taking a look at your child while they're sleeping, definitely during three parts of the night, because a lot of times you'd be amazed, like recording them, like things that you'll see. And, you know, like I said, the snoring, the mouth breathing, clenching, grinding, bedwetting, restless sleep, hyperactivity before bedtime. A lot of these are really a struggle to breathe for a lot of these kids. So I highly encourage observation. So, and then that's kind of all with my questions. So if anybody has any other questions, definitely feel free to put it in the question drop box, type that in, and I can answer anything at the end as well. So I guess now I'm going to kind of pass it off to Dr. Robinson. Can I just add something? Can you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I just want to mention, so what, so Lauren's, um, Lauren can, she has so much information about this that yeah. uh, I just let, I'm sure everyone um, is like, oh my God, I just need to know more about this and um, give me more information. So um, Lauren and Dr. Robinson will be doing um, future lectures together um, with more information about this. So, cause Lauren could have her own, her, her own, um, you know, total lecture um, and we would still be asking for more. So I know that was just like a little snippet. <clears throat> no, th uh, I can't, I can't, um, I can't emphasize enough how much, how proud I am of Lauren because um, Lauren and I have been working together for a, a long time. And so she has, uh, she, I, I always know that she knows so much, but to hear her speak about this stuff is um, truly, uh, uh, um, really, really neat for me. So um, that was a great job, Lauren. I really appreciate it. Um, and so Lauren kind of answered a lot of my questions for me, but I, I pulled up one here that I thought was interesting. So this is one that we got um, today. And let me, um, let me, okay. So it says, so it says, I am a pediatric occupational therapist in Canada, and one of the SLPs I work with is very knowledgeable about tongue ties and oral rest, resting posture. However, my question is about adults. I actually have a quite a tongue tie myself. I never had feeding or speech issues as a child, but as an adult, I have frequent jaw tightness, pain, ear pain, and notice myself clenching a lot. My rest posture is okay. I'm not a mouth breather. Would having a tongue tie release help with my symptoms? Can you speak a little bit more about adult tongue ties and how even how even if there don't seem to be issues in childhood, they can cause issues later in life? Um, so yeah, I mean, this is one that like, you know, to be honest with you, I see on a frequent basis, um, you know, what I do uh, sun up to sun down is uh, I treat people who have, who have adults, people who have breathing issues, people who have pain. And so, um, like Lauren said, you know, a lot of these, and, and to Joanna's point as well, a lot of these, you know, tongue ties are kind of undiagnosed. Um, and people make their way through life with um, varying levels of compensations. And so these compensations can last for so long. But, uh, you know, one of the main things that I learned is that a compensation only lasts so long. Eventually, the body's going to give out. And eventually there's going to be, there's going to be symptoms. And so we don't go looking for this stuff and trying to help people that are adults, um, uh, trying to release their tongue tie. We wait for patients to find us to tell, tell us about their symptoms. And then of course, upon a thorough examination, um, sure enough, a lot of times we will find a restricted tongue, something that hasn't been diagnosed. And like Joanna said, you know, sometimes, 
I see adults where they're located right on the tip of the tongue, you know, they're your typical, you know, class one, uh, we're talking about the uh, baby um, classifications, class one right on the tip of the tongue. And then I see the posterior tongue ties that, that are in our practice all the time that Lauren and I work with. And so um, for this particular question, you know, frequent jaw type, uh, uh, tightness, you know, pain in your ear. Um, these are things that could be directly correlated to a restriction in your mouth, whether it's a tongue tie or not. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, we would have to do a, a thorough evaluation and try and find, find that out. And as far as a release goes for something like that, we really take into account everything. As a kid, there's no reason never to release a tongue tie. Like kids, we release tongue ties all the time. As long as the mother is going to do the exercises, is going to be committed to post-op, is going to be committed to myofunctional therapy, there's no reason why we would never not release a tongue in a kid. Um, now in adults, there's a, there's a lot of reasons why we would not release a tongue tie. Um, like Lauren was talking about, some of our patients grow up with having like a little coffee straw to breathe through. And so, you know, and, and, and craniofacially, they're just not developed enough. So we see a lot of patients in our practice with these really, really narrow um, arches, these really high palatal vaults, and there's nowhere for that tongue to go. So what happens when I release that tongue and set it free? You tell me. The, what I'm thinking is it's going to go straight to the back and cut off the air supply. So we really do a very thorough examination to figure out whether or not someone would benefit from a, a release or not. Um, and so I just, I just put a couple slides in here that I thought were pretty productive. You know, so for people who don't know anatomy, um, the tongue is consists of eight muscles. And so there's a, there, people just think the tongue is one muscle. The tongue is actually eight muscles, eight pairs of muscles as uh, to be, to be, um, to be accurate, so 16 muscles in total. So one of the muscles here that I've highlighted is what's called the styloglossus muscle. So the styloid process is this little piece of bone right here, as you can see my cursor right up there by the ear, right? So the styloid process is the piece of bone that hangs down, okay? That muscle connects directly with the tip of the tongue. So if we have a restriction with the tongue and we've learned how to compensate and our swallow is poor, our rest posture is poor, things that have been kind of building up and maybe they weren't severe, maybe they were mild, they've been building up the whole entire life, eventually we're probably going to develop symptoms in other areas of the body. And so ear pain and jaw pain, 100%, I'm checking under the hood every single time somebody comes into my office, I'm lifting up the tongue, I'm doing a functional evaluation to figure out whether that tongue is restricted restricted or not. Um, so to answer the question, you know, um, absolutely, you may benefit from a release. Um, but it's not something that we would, we could tell you definitive, definitively, unless we did a full evaluation. And, um, you know, if anybody knows anything about the body, we're talking about the, the fascial system, right? So the fascial system is basically the spider web effect that connects everything in the whole entire body. So the musculoskeletal system um, is basically interconnected. So, you know, the whole saying the, the arm bone is connected to the leg bone is true because of the fascial system. And so all of these muscles have to be kind of working in unison and working in symmetry and working together in order to help people have correct posture and in order to help people breathe and in order to help people have less injuries, right? And so if the tongue is restricted, what we find is, like Lauren said, a lot of people that have restricted tongues, a lot of people that have tongue ties, they present with forward head posture. They present with this loss of, of, of a lordosis within their neck. They present with these kyphotic curves in their spine. They present with lower back pain. I mean, I, I released someone a couple of weeks ago, um, a couple of weeks before we, we got shut down, and basically her 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 symptoms were lower back pain. She was a runner, and um, she she's been running for a long time and she's now into her forties and she's finally, you know, come to the conclusion that, that she doesn't want to deal with pain anymore. And so, you know, she's been through every single doctor and chiropractors, physical therapist, you name it, and nobody's been able to help her. And so once I did a full evaluation, I was like, did anybody tell you, you have a grade three tongue tie? And she's like, no, nobody has. Um, and that just goes on and on. We see that, you know, uh, frequently in our practice. And so we released her tongue because she had a good enough airway. We released her tongue because she was committed to myofunctional therapy. We released her tongue because um, she wanted to get better. And so 
you know, these myofascial lines of the body uh, just prove that everything is kind of connected. Um, and when they do these dissections, and this was done not too long ago, but actually this is a cool, this is a really cool slide. It's, it's some fascia and what it shows is the deep frontal line. So when you dissect a human cadaver, what you find is that just through fascia, we're not talking about um, anything but the, the, the fascia um, connections within the body, the tongue actually is connected all the way down to um, the psoas of the toes, and so it's it's quite um, it's it's quite fun to do a release on an adult who has been restricted their whole life. And some of the uh, some of the things that we get um, on a daily basis when I do a release is, oh my gosh, it almost feels like all the tension is is released in my shoulders. It almost feels like I can actually breathe into my stomach. It feels like I'm less stressed. And sometimes these patients even get like this vasovagal type of response. And we've actually had a patient who actually became unconscious in the chair um, while we were doing a release. And it's because of, of, of you release a tissue that's been tight for say 30, 40, 50, 60 years, you know, the body will react to it. And, you know, we even, we ask our patients while we're doing the release. And I think one of my assistants, Amanda's on here and she's done a ton of them with me. Um, we say, how do you feel? And a lot of patients will just, will say, Hey, my, my, my toes feel a little bit more wiggly. My toes feel a little bit different. And he's like, is that supposed to happen? I'm like, well, it's different for everybody. Um, but it just goes to show you how connected the tongue is to the whole entire body. Um, so that's been, um, you know, something that um, I've introduced into my practice a couple of years ago. And uh, we, we haven't looked back. I mean, we don't release everybody. We're very selective in who we release. Like, like I said, we want to make sure they're committed to myofunctional therapy. In our practice, we do four to six weeks of myofunctional therapy first. Uh, we do the release, which takes about an hour. I do a functional release. I don't do a, a, a laser. Um, with kids, we have to do it with a laser. Obviously, that's the best way to do it for healing purposes. For adults, we actually use um, sutures and scissors. Um, and it is a very functional release. It is where we're having the... the um, adult go through exercises while we're actually doing the release. Um, and it's a really cool procedure that then is followed up with another four to six weeks of Lauren's uh, time and commitment afterwards. And so uh, Lauren and I really are a team with this and I would never release somebody's tongue unless they committed to working with Lauren for at least, at least four weeks prior and at least four to six weeks oh, after. And I don't, I don't make, I don't make, um, I don't, I don't bend on, on my role there at all. I don't, I don't make exceptions for anybody because I know that my results, I want my results to be good. And the way that we found that our results are good as myofunctional therapy, functional release, myofunctional therapy. So, you know, we say it over and over and over again, myofunctional therapy is our secret. That's like our secret sauce. So all of my sleep, my TMJ patients, all of my tongue tie patients, it comes down to myofunctional therapy. Lauren is, is basically the driver. I'm just, I'm just the surgeon who comes in there and makes the release. Lauren is the one responsible for having the success that we find in our practice. You know, so hopefully that was a long winded um, explanation of um, that. I believe she was an occupational therapist that, that sent that in. Yeah. From Canada, occupational therapist. Yep. So hopefully that answered your question. Um, and hopefully you're on tonight. Um, so with that, I mean, I would like to open it up and uh, get some more questions. Do we have any more come in while I was talking? Yes. Which, what, do you, what do you have, Lauren? Well, it looks like the two that I'm seeing here are for Dr. Green. Okay. Oh, I see here. So um, let me answer from Kelly. Mm -hmm. um, she has a question about a, an infant that a lip, had a lip tongue tie revision. Um, <clears throat> and then she's saying that basically, um, at her post-op appointment, it had started to reattach. She was recommended to do the stretches. Should she come back again? Um, so my, my answer to that is, um, what we typically do at the two week post-op appointment at my office is, um, we look at the symptoms that brought you in. So what was point A, um, what were you going through? We have like a whole checklist. We have the referral from the, um, from the feeding specialist. And then we compare um, the starting point to like the two week point. And so the most important thing that we look at is how have symptoms changed. So um, when we have improvement in symptoms and typically I would say, let's say a mom comes in with like five things that are um, bothering, <clears throat> bothering her, whether that's like pain, um, um, maybe, uh, 
bad weight gain, um, failure to thrive, you know, things like that. We look at like, how has it gotten um, better? How has it gotten worse? Um, or has it stayed the same? And so at two weeks, we typically see across the board, things will get better. Um, when we do not see any improvement in nursing, we still have pain, we still see um, like poor weight gain, et cetera. Um, that's when we start to think about, hey, is there enough reattachment at this point to make it worrisome? Um, out of all the babies that I've treated in like 2019, I think I did a revision. So release is like the first time you do it. A revision is when you have to go back. I think I did maybe like three of them the entire year. So it's very uncommon um, because typically what we see with, with healing and especially at two weeks um, is that you'll have this little speed bump um, and you'll have, you may have not necessarily like reattachment, like frank reattachment, but it's more so um, like a slight new frenum that, that is forming because of the um, actual healing process. So at two weeks, it's at its tightest, it's at its worst point, it's scar tissue. Um, it takes about eight weeks for everything to truly mature and resolve. Um, and so bottom line is we look at like how you're doing at two weeks, are things um, improving, like are the symptoms improving? And then we look at the frenum. So if the frenum looks really bad, like, totally reattached, nothing has improved, then we're like, all right, this, this could be a problem, this could be reattachment. But um, a little bit of like tightness, a little bit of reattachment um, with improvement of symptoms is not um, a reason to get a release done or revision done um, a second time because we don't know that the baby um, will do better the second time or if the parents will do a better job. Um, sometimes babies just heal with a lot of scar tissue. Um, and it's relatively uncommon, but I've definitely seen my fair share of them because I've done so many. Um, so my answer would be, if you have any doubt, definitely see your provider and have them take a look at it. But you have to um, kind of look at the big picture. It's not just how the freedom looks, okay? Awesome, awesome. Um, um, so why don't we, um, is there any other questions that we yeah, need? Yeah, it looks like, um, okay, so if you look at Chris, oh yeah, so um, Dr. Robinson and I went to Dr. Zaghi's course, do you see that, Ryan? Yeah, I see that, yeah. Yeah, so Chris, hi Chris, um, and so he was having pain, right, and um, Dr. Zaghi actually used him as a um, a live patient at the course that we were at, and it was phenomenal. So, I don't, Ryan, if you want to elaborate on that, do you see her question or her statement? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, Chris is Chris is awesome. Chris yeah. and I have been uh, she's communicating up in, uh, for, in Maryland. Uh, yeah, Down for, in Maryland. yeah. She's I believe she's in uh, Westminster, right? Something like that. Um, and uh, she's got a she's got a she's got a really rocking program that she's got going on out there. I've been following her um, for a while. She's amazing. Like I mean, yeah. you know, I'm just. I just get so excited when I see people like Chris and people like um, Lauren and people like, you know, Leah Heckman, these people that just really are taking like the time out of their scope of what they were taught to like learn all this stuff that's so alternative to them. And it's, it's just like, it's so, so cool and so powerful because the therapists, like I say, like I can't emphasize it enough. The therapists are the ones that make all the difference in the world. I mean, I am the doctor. I'm the one who does the release. Joanna is the doctor. She's the one that does the release. And I mean, we're responsible for, you know, bringing some of this information together. But I mean, our therapists are just truly, you know, what makes our, uh, what makes our office uh, a success. So, I mean, we got to give it all up to them. And so Chris, I, I remember your, your husband was having this clicking. How is that going? Uh, it, are you, uh, are you available to get on here or what? Can I unmute you? See if we can find her. Chris. Where is she? Oh, here, I think I got her. Hello. Hi. Hey, Chris, how are you? I'm great, thank you. So my husband's headaches, he has not woken up with another headache since then. Wow. So it's two years. Yeah, Chris, can you, can you tell the audience um, like what you do, who you are? I am a certified oral facial myofunctional therapist in Westminster, Maryland. Yes, <laughs> Westminster. <laughs> we don't want to hear about Mount Airy, okay, guys? <laughs> people are doing some weird things in the grocery stores here. <laughs> um, yeah, wear your mask. 
Um, yeah, so uh, Misty and I, Misty Bridges, who is on here also, they, they do a lot of assessments with babies, Misty and Marge. So I'm hoping they chime in with some really good questions for you guys. Um, so uh, Misty and I have developed a webinar series just for oral facial myofunctional therapists. And so they will be getting IUM credits. Uh, you have to go through a whole rigmarole to get the IUM credits. You have to meet certain criteria as well as AGD credits. So those are good things that we're, we're trying to do for the therapists at a much more affordable cost and giving all of our experience. Um, as far as my husband, oh my gosh, that was incredible with his heart rate variability. I mean, Dr. Um, Hinden was <laughs> so on me, like he couldn't believe that I did not know my husband was in pain the way he was with a cramp in his neck he walked around with for 54 years. So it, it, was, it was an incredible experience for all of us. I learned so much from his case uh, with adult patients. Mm -hmm. And I mean, certainly Dr. Zaghi um, from the Breathe Institute, um, Dr. Robinson and myself, like we, we flew out to, um, well, we went to that course, we've gone to um, his office in uh, LA and we've, um, we've been to the Breathe Institute, and it's just a phenomenal um, institute that they have going on there and um, really forefront of education and research, most importantly. So for those of you that don't know who Dr. Zaghi is, he is an ENT. So um, he has, um, and he's um, Stanford educated. So just a lot, of, um, a lot of education, a lot of clout to what he does. And um, he's really a, a leader in worldwide for uh, functional frenuloplasties. So um, Dr. Robinson and I trained under him. So um, certainly learning from the best. Yeah, and I'm, I'm really grateful to you guys. Um, I'm so happy. Um, I really, I know a lot of us wanna hear about your practice and um, a lot on the baby stuff, what you're seeing and how you're working with your IBCLCs and just your whole program and the flow of things. Yeah, so Chris, let's um let's get into that. I want to first let okay. um I want to first let Lauren um address this one question to her from Jackie. Um, sure. So Lauren, did you see that question from Jackie? Yeah, I did see that one. Yep. So and, for uh, that question, real quick, Lauren. Oh, yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry to interrupt you. As soon as you get done, I think we should open it up and uh, have some of our IBCLCs uh, kind of unmute themselves and chime in here, so we can have a good conversation. I think we have some really talented IBCLCs on here tonight that may want to um, join the conversation. Sure. So I actually um, got my biofunctional certification at the IAOM, which is the International, International Association of Oral Facial Myology with Sandra Haltzman. And I also did um, my Boteco training with Patrick McEwen. And then I also did Meyer Brace as well, which is like functional appliances that I use in conjunction with doing myofunctional therapy. And I'm just trying to think of there. And then Crystal Robinson, who uh, also that we kind of, I work closely with as well. Um, their office is in Indiana, right, Dr. Robinson? Yeah, South Bend, Indiana. Yeah. Yep. Dr. Clower, yeah. So she is an oral facial myofunctional therapist as well. So I've had some training with her. And then I guess the other question that you asked was about webinar, and I have webinars here. Or, what was the question? I'm trying to find it now. Um, education courses or lectures. I I would say like at this point, I don't, I don't, but I definitely think it's probably something we're leaning towards doing. So. Awesome. Yeah, cool. All right. So with, um, with that being said, let's, uh, hey, hey, Corinne. Are you yes. there? Yes. <laughs> hey, how are you? I or you were unmuting. No, I, I unmuted you. So thank you. Um, so anyway, so Corinne is a, um, she's an IBCLC and she actually works downstairs in the birth center, which is directly underneath us. And so Corinne and Gwen and Katie Madden and the whole team of um, lactation 
uh, at the birth center has been incredible resources for us. And we've started um, a great relationship with them a number of years back. And um, I think our relationship's just getting better and better and better. And we've, we've, we've gotten um, a much better, a much better productive workflow as far as like what we know that she does, what she knows that we do. I mean, we frequently text, we email all the time. I know Joanne has probably got um, Corinne and Gwen and Katie on her speed dial, you know, as needed. Cause, um, it's a, it's a truly, it's a multidisciplinary effort. So, um, Corinne, why don't you just give like a, a quick little, um, introduction of yourself. And, uh, I think you'll probably have some questions here. Sure. Um, hi, my name's Corinne. I'm an RN and I'm an IBCLC and I work at the birth center, which is in the same building as pain and sleep, but on the first floor. Um, and I work with a lot of mom and babies. Probably about 30% of the moms that I see are birth center patients and the other 70% other um, gave birth at the hospital, mostly at Christiana. Um, and I see them for all kinds of breastfeeding problems, but because everyone or almost everyone that I see is having problems, a lot of them end up having tongue ties. A lot of the babies end up having tongue ties. Awesome, awesome. And Corinne does a fantastic job. Of, of helping our parents and our, our mamas compassionately. And yes, well, I think that the, the best thing about working with Ryan and Joanna is that I feel so confident knowing that if I send a mom and baby there, they're going to be well taken care of. And I know that they're going to have a great experience. And um, thank you. It definitely takes the, it, it eases my mind knowing that I'm, I'm sending them into good hands. And uh, I have to say, and vice versa. I mean, when, when we have a referral that comes in, I mean, I'm so for, for those of you who don't know, Joanna is um, 38 weeks pregnant. And so she has been away from patient care. So I'm doing 100% of the babies these days for the next few months, um, in addition to everything else. But it's actually a good time because I'm kind of not doing everything else going on that we have. So um, I, Joanna and I always joke, we're like, um, but when, when Marissa and Carrie come, come into our office and they're like, okay, we have, um, you know, baby Leon here, blah, blah, blah. And Joanne and I are like, where are they from? And uh, Marissa and Carrie go, oh, they're from uh, Gwen or they're from Corinne or whatever. And we're like, yes. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just because we know that we know that they're going to get the proper care that they need. And so um, not to poo poo anybody else, but they've just set up just like a, they've set up such a great program that, you know, we know that our, our moms and our babies are going to get taken care of. And, and, you know, it really makes us look good. We want to make them look good, but they really, I, I, I say it over and over and over again, the therapists make us look good. Us surgeons look good. We do the release, but then, you know, the post-op and all that and the follow-up, I mean, um, you know, Corinne and Gwen, they spend so much time taking care of these babies and these parents. Um, so I think that that was an important thing that you said about um, making it such an uh, it's such a big thing for you that they have to follow up with the therapist and it sets you apart from a lot of other practices because they will, you know, release any frenum that is there and that doesn't always have the best outcome. So if you know that mom and baby are seeing a lactation consultant and they're getting good care and you know that they're going to go back there, then you're going to get the results that mm. they need and that you want to see. Hey, Corinne, and maybe this is a good question for you and Joanna. Um, so um, Jackie asked whether or not we have a craniosacral therapist in our office. And so we don't have a craniosacral therapist in our office, Jackie, but we do work with one. Um, and I know Corinne's had a lot of kind of firsthand experience with um, someone in her office who does that and, and who um, works with the baby. So Corinne, can you give us a couple, uh, just a little bit on, on CST? Yes, I, I know two craniosacral fascial therapists. So we have one that is going to be seeing patients at the birth center. Her name is Julia Kegelman, and she's also a physical therapist, but because of COVID-19, she hasn't started seeing anyone in person there yet. Um, and then another craniosacral fascial therapist that I've referred a lot of babies to is named Colleen McLaughlin. And right now she's seeing, well, she was until COVID-19, seeing patients in North Wilmington. Um, that is somewhere that we refer a lot of babies who maybe have a lot of functional, um, deficits in the tongue, but not necessarily appearance wise. So all of the babies that we see, we do a hat lift on. And if I see a baby that has a normal or almost normal appearance, but not a normal function, sometimes my first step is body work. And I'll refer to craniosacral um, fascial therapy. And then after that, if there's no improvement, then I'm referring to Dr. Green. And then generally back to uh, craniosacral after that. Yeah. 
Yeah, it can be, it's a really important part for, um, for a lot of babies. Um, I think it's becoming more common to have babies just see uh, CST even before, you know, any baby to see it because um, like Ryan was um, talking about earlier, the, the fascial system and how everything is um, interconnected. It's that, that spider web kind of covering. And so if you can relax one part, um, even for us um, as providers and doing the actual surgery, we can, um, we may be able to get better results, um, visualize more frenum, um, and the baby will have a better post-op experience if they're not tense, um, don't have like that, you know, um, kind of restriction that's not just in their tongue, but maybe in their neck and they're feeling it throughout their body. So a lot of benefits to it. And it's, um, you know, there's not a lot of like hard research on it. You're not going to find like a meta-analysis on it, but it is as holistic and as non-invasive as you can possibly get. And usually like the babies um, and the moms are like, please, like, I love this. Like, let me come every, every week, twice a week. Um, There's really no risk involved. Exactly. And, and the wonderful thing about our collaboration is that Joanna will say to me, I saw this baby, you know, I did the release barely could get inside the baby's mouth, you know, he or she was so tight. I really think this baby could need body work. Yeah. And so sometimes I'll do, I'll, um, it just depends on the situation. Sometimes I will not do the procedure and I'll be like, I cannot do this. You need to, we need to like do it like a week or a few sessions or whatnot, come back and see me, um, afterwards. And, um, you know, sometimes it's, we need to do this release right now. Um, and you need to go to to see um, the CST like right away and continue with like the healing process. So it just depends on the situation, but um, most babies have a good improvement with it. Mm -hmm. I would agree with that. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Hey, Leah, you, you got anything over there? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, I think we tried to unmute at the same time. <laughs> um, no, this is just, this is wonderful too. I love collaborating with other professionals. Um, I mean, this is um, a huge part of how we learn. So I think it's really important that we're doing this. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for being a part of this. Yeah. Sure. Does anyone have any questions about Lauren and Buteco breathing? Because that is, that's something that's like, um, not totally um, like mainstream. I don't know that a lot of people know what that is, but we've had, um, Lauren literally learned from like the number one, um, the, the world leader in Buteco breathing education. Um, and we've had such fantastic results with um, breathing techniques and retraining breathing for our pediatric, our kids. Um, to, a, to adults and um, she just had such really um, great results and it's really just retraining breathing patterns. Mm -hmm. so. Hey Joanna, I wanted you to address one thing before Lauren. Sure. Um, Misty was asking a quick question about wound care, not to get too lengthy. I know every provider is different, but do you advise mom touching the wound in babies to stretch? Um, so no, we, we, so when I first started, we used to do um, an actual like rub. Um, but we got away from that. We did like a, a trial um, of many months and we were like, all right, what is going to heal better? And so now we only recommend lifting um, and stretching. So we don't do any sweeps or any physical touch of the actual, um, the diamond. Okay. So it's just lifting the tongue up. Um, we found that it creates less scar tissue and less kind of like reactive tissue to it. So we've had really good results with that. Um, okay, so and then Jackie was asking, uh, Lauren, you, why don't you take over for a minute? Why don't you give everybody just a brief little introduction about what Botega breathing is? Yeah. And then we can um, so Botega breathing is a series of exercises. So it's aimed at developing like healthy breathing patterns in both adults and children. 
So the main goals of Otago Breathing are really to promote nasal breathing, relaxation. We really want the breath to reach the diaphragm. Um, as we engage that diaphragmatic muscle, as, it, as it's expanding inward and outward, it massages the intestines as well that aid with digestion. And it also helps to increase like oxygen saturation. So we really have, want that equal level of both like oxygen and CO2 in the body. So typically I always help people kind of like you'll, you'll hear on the radio right now, um, on the news, like commercials, like, oh, everyone take a deep breath. And when you think of deep breathing, you're kind of like <sighs> this way. So it's like, you're noticing the shoulders are rising. It's out of your mouth. You're utilizing the chest. Um, we're really like our breathing should come from the diaphragm. Our lips should be closed and it should be through the nose and it should be like soft, slow, effortless breath. Um, you really shouldn't hear your breathing. So with like Bottega breathing, it is kind of a series of exercises that aim at establishing those goals and really equalizing both um, CO2 and oxygen in the blood. A lot of times people, we've kind of been taught to believe that, you know, if we kind of do that deep breathing, that's how we get oxygen to the lungs. But our lungs are already saturated in oxygen. So actually oxygen deficiency isn't caused by a lack of oxygen. It's actually a lack of CO2. So the Bottega really helps to equalize both of those. So, and there was a question that asked if I incorporate that into my Mayo program. Absolutely. Um, it isn't something that I do separately, but with um, myofunctional therapy, I have phases of goals that I try to achieve. Um, I feel like I could really go into all of that. So it's definitely, I think, for another time, um, really going over the goals of myofunctional therapy. But yes, I really do um, incorporate that in with my myofunctional therapy. Yeah, and I'll speak to that just real quick because. Um... I mean, again, I know you guys are getting tired of me, of me saying it, but like I use, I use my functional therapy with literally everything. I mean, whether it's a patient who comes in with sleep apnea or a patient that has jaw pain or just someone coming in with undiagnosed head, uh, pain of the head and neck. I mean, I'm literally using Lauren for pretty much every single one of my, of my treatment plans. Um, Lauren is extremely busy. We, we, I mean, to be completely um, transparent with you guys, we were worried about bringing Lauren from the general practice because we didn't know if we could keep her busy. And um, here we are. And she's, she works, she works more than anybody. She was, she's busier than me um, because, you know, I make the diagnosis, I make the treatment plan. I set forth the path of treatment and pretty much every single one of my treatment plans involves some sort of my functional therapy. So I keep Lauren extremely busy. Um, so she has her own patients plus she has to deal with all my um, pain in the butt patients as well. <laughs> yeah, and on that note too, with a lot of um, the patients that Dr. Robinson sees that have sleep apnea, um, really like slowing the breathing down, there's like less susceptibility for that airway to collapse. So anytime someone's snoring or they have that vibrate noise, that's kind of the first sign that happens before the collapse of the airway. So it is important to really slow that breathing down, um, especially as we go through the sleep cycles, like cycle five that we kind of go into, the diaphragm and the heart are still working at that point. So we really do want to have that slower breathing and establish that during the day. Um, and a lot of my patients that I work with, um, we usually have them download Snore Lab so they can kind of track their progression. And with doing the exercises, even with wearing the appliance, we also talk about mouth taping as well. We see a huge difference in the noise that they do. It's literally stopped completely with incorporating Boteco in with um, the therapy that Dr. Robinson does as well. So. Hey Lauren, real quick, just tell um, tell yeah. about uh, a couple of these patients that you have. So we use a pulse ox in our, in our office. It's part of our screening process. And so um, we see a lot of patients that come in that are like uh, operating on you know, less than ideal uh, oxygen uh, conditions. So they're very hypoxic, just, um, you know, yeah. sitting in the chair, not even at nighttime, not even like a sleep breathing problem, but like a daytime mm -hmm. breathing problem. So Lauren, tell them about that patient that I think it was you and then Alyssa has a couple of cool cases as well, where they came yeah. in and I think they were running on like 92% oxygen. So for all of you guys who don't uh, know the oxygen levels that uh, the body, the blood is supposed to have. So you should be at above 95, no matter what, you should never drop below 95% oxygen. So when you drop below 95% oxygen in the hospital, just to, for frame of reference, 
the nurses will come over and say, hey, is everything okay? If you drop below 92% oxygen in the hospital, that's indication for a nurse to actually bag you and start giving you supplemental oxygen. So some of our patients that we see are dropping into the 60s, into the 70s at nighttime when they're sleeping. But a lot of these patients that are walking in um, to our office, they're, they're running in the low 90s during the day. And so Lauren does some of these um, exercises with the pulse ox on the finger, and she literally will get their oxygen to go from like 91 to like 99%, like, like within 20, 10 minutes. Yeah. I mean, a lot of it is too. I mean, a lot of the patients that are coming in, I mean, they are mouth breathing and, you know, with doing the exercises, we're establishing the nasal breathing. We're slowing it down. Cause a lot of times when you're mouth breathing, it's kind of like that hyperventilation, like you're, you're like breathing heavy. Um, so slowing it down and with doing a lot of the exercises as well it is I do it with kids too, but even some of my adult patients, I actually have to tape their lips while we do the session really to facilitate using the nose for breathing. So yeah, the, the number does go up once we slow it down and we're utilizing just the nose, um, which is what it's intended for is to be breathed out of. Yep. So guys, I think we're going to wrap things up unless anybody has any more, um, any more uh, comments. I think we're going to try and be respectful of your time. We had planned on being uh, eight to nine, but of course, you know, as notorious for my lectures, we go way over. And if uh, Jen was on here right now, she'd be, she, if she was in the back of the room right now, she'd be giving me the stink eye, um, telling me to wrap, wrap things up. Um, so we're going to try and be respectful of your time and um, let everybody go. But I think this is an extremely productive conversation. Um, I want to thank Joanna um, Green, Dr. Green, for taking time out of her schedule. She is about to deliver a baby and she wanted to make this a priority for everybody. Um, so kudos to you for getting, getting dialed up and I haven't seen your hair hair look that good in, in a few weeks. I know it hasn't happened in three weeks. <laughs> yeah, so um, I appreciate that, Lauren. As always, you're 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 a uh, just a, such a such a book of knowledge, and so you know we really thankful to have you on my team. And so to everybody else that logged in tonight, um, hopefully you learned some things. Hopefully we made some good uh, networking connections here. I know there were some patients here. I know there were some providers here. Um, so to everybody, thank you so much for your time. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll be sure to do more of these um, in the future and make sure that uh, we get the word out to everybody so that we can all log on and uh, continue to have this uh, really productive conversation. All right. Thank you, everyone. Bye. All right, guys. Have a good night. Be safe.